Welcome to Israel in Depth, where scholars, policymakers, and leading experts come to discuss topics about Israel in depth. You're listening to a podcast by the UCLA Nazarian Center for Israel Studies. I'm Dov Waxman, the director of the Nazarian Center and the host of this podcast. Joining me for this episode of Israel in Depth is Professor Dana L. Kurd. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Richmond and a non-resident senior fellow at the Arab Center, Washington, D.C. She's the author of Polarized and Demobilized, Legacies of Authoritarianism in Palestine, published by Oxford University Press in 2020. I highly recommend the book. The book examines how international intervention can distort state society relations and reinforce authoritarianism. And among the cases that she focuses on them in the book is the US intervention in the consolidation of the Palestinian Authority and how that actively encouraged authoritarian dynamics in the Palestinian Authority. So we're gonna talk a bit about the Palestinian Authority and that authoritarian dynamic. Um, but before we do that, I wanna thank you, uh, Professor el Kurd, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Um, so the war in Gaza is obviously still very much far from over. Um, but the question of who will govern Gaza after Hamas is already on the international and regional agenda, and it's been generating a lot of discussion, a lot of conversation. Um, so I want to discuss this question with you of governance uh, of Gaza. Uh, but before we get to kind of the day after question and, the, and, and, and what might happen in the Gaza Strip after Hamas, I want to first of all take a step back, and I think it would be helpful uh, for our listeners to talk a bit about Hamas's rule in Gaza. Um, how did Hamas come to rule Gaza and the nature of its rule there? So could you just give us a little bit of that background, first of all, in terms of Hamas's rule in the Gaza Strip, how that came about, and tell us a little bit about the nature of Hamas's rule there. Yeah, of course. Um, so to understand why we have Hamas in Gaza to begin with and why there is this kind of split in governance, we have to go back to um, the aftermath of the Second Intifada. Second Intifada, the Second Palestinian Uprising, um, was a more fragmented and violent uh, episode um, and used violent uh, uh, methods and tactics in a way that was not seen in the past. Um, so in the aftermath of that, there was First of all, uh, a great deal of insecurity, obviously, for the Israeli public and a great deal of insecurity for the Palestinian public as well, uh, given kind of the um, Israeli backlash and repression. And so there was um, a great deal of interest on the part of international uh, actors with the U.S., you know, form, foremost among them um, to um, make sure that something like that didn't happen again. Um, so there was an interest in consolidating the role of the Palestinian Authority um, retraining the security forces during the second intifada, part of the security forces had split off, and essen like essentially making sure that that kind of fragmentation in Arabic infilat, um, so an unspooling. I'm not really sure if that's the correct uh, translation, but that never happens uh, again. Um, part of that, given the time frame we're talking about here, so 2004, 2005, part of that had also to do with the American foreign policy at the time, which was, you know, neoconservative, uh, promote, you know, democracy promotion, quote unquote, um, a great deal of interest in um, being seen as successful in changing the landscape of the Middle East. So there was a lot of pressure on the Palestinian Authority, which was dominated by Fatah Party, the party of Yasser Arafat, the party of Mahmoud Abbas, to um, uh, put forward elections, put forward parliamentary elections. Now, in reporting after the fact, and 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 some of the some of the papers that have come out, like with the Palestine Papers and things like that, um, we now have evidence to show that the Palestinian Authority leaders warned the United States and its allies that they probably couldn't win. They probably couldn't win because people were really fed up. Um, they were uh, upset with the fact that the peace process had gone nowhere, that the uh, time frame that was supposed to manifest the state for them had not had come and gone. So by 1999, um, but that wasn't heeded uh, as a warning. Um, and so parliamentary elections moved forward. They were free and fair elections. I believe President Carter uh, was there as an observer. Um, in any case, so uh, Hamas wins a plurality in the parliament. Now it's a parliamentary system. Plurality means they will have to join a coalition government. Um, this is blocked by the United States, by the, the Palestinian Authority leadership. Um, and Hamas is not allowed to govern 
Now, the reason behind that is because people, the international actors involved, um, seem to think that they're, you know, Hamas has a particular charter like would not be a partner for peace, disagrees with that notion of two-state solution. Hamas experts like Tarek Bakoni suggest that like that was that was there was a possibility there to maybe move them off that trajectory. Um we can't really speak in counterfactuals. What essentially happened, whether or not you believe that Hamas should have been allowed to govern or not, um, is that the United States did not allow the elections uh results to move forward. Uh, they sanctioned the Palestinians. Um, people who worked for the Palestinian Authority didn't get salaries for months. The, you know, there was a, a great toll on the Palestinian economy, um, which led to an attempt by Fatah to um, overthrow Hamas and not allow them to um, uh, take over. Which the and, US may have encouraged that uh, attempt to take over. Indeed, encouraged. Yes, actively encouraged. Um, they provided uh, funds at a time when the Palestinian Authority was sanctioned, they provided funds through personal accounts of Palestinian leaders um, so that they could enlarge the presidential guard and make sure that they could fight Hamas. A lot of different um, strategies at play there. Um, what happens is in fighting between Fatah and Hamas, Hamas um, is able to stay in control of the Gaza Strip, but is kicked out of the West Bank. Um, and so that was, I mean, there had already been restrictions on the Gaza Strip in the aftermath of Israel's disengagement in 2005, but that's when really the blockade that we understand today as kind of the status quo, that's when it begins, is when Hamas takes over in Gaza. So um, since then, there have not been any elections, not in the Gaza Strip or the West Bank, and this is why we have had fragmentation. Now, at any point when there have been I can't even count how many times. Numerous attempts. Yeah, yeah, so many times Hamas and Fatah have attempted to reconcile in order to uh, stop the fragmentation of Palestinian politics. But there, there really isn't any international, Israeli, any support um, for for that move. Um, and as um, Tara Bakoni, the the author of Hamas Contained, has highlighted uh, numerous occasions, um, this created a violent equilibrium between Hamas and Israel that they attempted to upend on October 7th. So, yeah, I think I brought you guys up to speed. Yeah. <laughs> Just on the question of the, the the failure to reconcile between Hamas and Fatah, so do you think, I mean, this is based upon, you know, your work and your book about external intervention. Do you think that a large part of the reason why Fatah and Hamas were, were unable to reconcile was because of the kind of condition that were put upon that reconciliation or because of, you know, outside actors, it was less kind of, that, that, in other words, that Hamas and Fatah themselves actually wanted to reconcile um, all these parts of the movements, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but it was, but the, the kind of prolongation of this um, fragmentation, this division was, was in part the result of international actors in the United States in particular, is that fair? Um, yeah, I think the international actors involved and their lack of um, urgency or or any really any desire to see that kind of reconciliation and the kind of fallback on the status quo as it existed um, definitely, I think, altered the incentive structure um, for, for leadership on both sides, I would imagine, because on the Palestinian Authority side, they're not going to really take hard steps to see through that reconciliation. It could mean the end of their terms. It could mean some level of instability as there's maybe an international a backlash to that. And on Hamas' side, they also, you know, as I said before October 7th, um, they had entered into a kind of equilibrium where they were getting certain kinds of resources and weapons and aid to remain in this status quo. So I think there wasn't, a, I think the international, the international actors involved, not just the United States, but including the United States, um, created an incentive structure where the fragmentation was the status quo and, and people kind of wanted to maintain that. And then, of course, we have all this reporting on from, you know, the Israeli side that they've seen Hamas as an right. asset and yes. They, yes. they don't really want the end of fragmentation because that would entail, well, I think they're giving too much credit to the United States at this point, but they thought it would entail returning to the two-state, uh, you know, conversation. And so they didn't, right. they don't want to have to deal with that seriously. So absolutely, we know that, you know, that Netanyahu saw that as a, an Israeli, or at least a, his own interest. Um, you you wrote uh, back in an article, back in September, an article in Jewish Currents about uh, Abbas and the, the relationship between the US and Abbas. And 
how in many ways, you know, post 2007, particularly, he has increasingly become autocratic, authoritarian. Uh, and, you know, you argue that this was, this in growing authoritarianism was in many ways um, facilitated by, promoted by the United States. Can you just kind of, I want to talk about Hamas's authoritarianism in a moment, mm -hmm. but just so we get the overall picture of kind of Palestinian governance leading up to October. So how do you think, why, 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 what, why did the United States um, encourage this or was it a kind of um, accidental byproduct of US intervention? Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you could talk a little bit about kind of what, what role the United States had in, in encouraging this growing authoritarianism within the Palestinian Authority. Well, the, fir the first, um, the first, you know, issue that we have to think about there is the lessons learned from the elections that are overturned. From Fatah's perspective, from those, in, you know, the dominant party in the Palestinian Authority, from their perspective, um, what, I mean, elite, you know, certain decision makers that I interviewed literally told me, like, there's a difference between democracy and making trouble. And they they literally said like the Americans taught us this lesson, so I think that's first and foremost like they saw a good deal of instability. They saw Palestinian infighting. Um, decision makers felt maybe to some degree like Palestinian society had proven that it cannot uh, uh, engage in democratic norms or accountability, given that they had the audacity to try to vote them out. Um, so. I, I think there's the lessons learned from that episode that kind of um, tighten, you know, tighten their grip. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so they, they felt like we, we can't have that experiment again. Um, but then also, you know, the United States was heavily involved in like, like I said, like uh, not only kind of the governance structure and, and, and um, how the security coordination functioned and how the security forces functioned and all the training and funding and things like this. Um, but, it, it it also led to a situation where everybody kind of understood that that elections weren't going to happen and the Palestinian Authority was the actor uh, elevated by the important international actors. And that just led to a great deal of impunity, um, I think, for the Palestinian Authority. And so over time, you see not only them coordinating with the Israeli occupation and maybe polit you know political repression, um, but also kind of going further and and um, cracking down on political dissent against themselves, um, things like the cybercrime law, so arresting people for Facebook posts, arresting student activists, a lot of that kind of stuff was happening, um, you know, for quite some time. So do you think that was, I mean, clearly it was partly a case of the United States signaling that it had lost any sort of appetite for Palestinian elections and preferred stability and security cooperation with Israel over, you know, um, democratic accountability and, and, uh, and, and pluralism. But I mean, to what extent was it also the emphasis upon um, beefing, building up the security services as opposed to other aspects of Palestinian governance, like the money is going toward the security people, essentially, right. um, and that is oh, the strongest. Deal. Most of the budget, I believe, is 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 in security. A good deal of the budget, yes. Um, so, I mean, to kind of combine this question with the earlier question, the part that I didn't get to, I think that the United States would um, benefit from a Palestinian Authority leader that actually had legitimacy and societal support. Um, so, I'm not I'm not suggesting necessarily that the United States actively is asking for the Palestinian Authority to crack down outside the realm of security coordination. Obviously, that is always uh, uh, paramount in, in everybody's mind. But like the way that the Palestinian Authority has functioned is goes beyond even the security coordination. Um, so I I don't think it's incidental. It's not accidental necessarily, but it's it's not it's just like a symptom of it's a the byproduct of yeah, that a byproduct. Yeah, um, a byproduct okay, so is the correct term. Yeah. So um, if that's how we can understand kind of the Palestinian authorities, authoritarianism, and, um, how do we understand Hamas? Uh, I mean, when we compare these two regimes, um, you know, both of which have been criticized by human rights groups for their treatment of dissent, arbitrary arrest, um, things like, 
you know, what? how do you think of Hamas's role? I mean, um, in on, on terms of governance alone, not in terms of its relations with Israel or anything like that, just in terms of how how did they govern Gaza? Did they become, were they author, was it authoritarian from the outset? Did it become more authoritarian over time in the way that Abbas's rule, I think, has become more authoritarian over time? And if it did, why do you, why, what was driving that process? So, um... Yeah, very good question. So Hamas's governance in the Gaza Strip is also quite authoritarian. We have a lot of polling to suggest that. There was polling from October 6th of this year uh, through the Air Barometer. Um, so Amani Jamel and Michael Robbins wrote uh, an article on this in um, Foreign Affairs. But there's also been successive um, polling through the Palestinian Center for Policy and Survey Research that shows Hamas um, is seen as quite corrupt, uh, is seen as not allowing for... Um, you know, freedom of expression and things like this. And so it's, you know, it's quite clear that Hamas has also governed in an authoritarian way. Obviously, also in the Gaza Strip, there haven't been elections. There isn't a feedback mechanism, really, between Palestinian society and any of its leadership. Now, part of this is that, like, you know, elections haven't been allowed to happen. Um, and they've been kind of pushed to the side, the idea of democratic accountability, we have to resolve the fragmentation first, we have to resolve the situation with Israel first. We have to resolve the blockade first. So there's that kind of element. I think there is an argument to be made about the fact that um, Hamas is an Islamist party as well. Uh, and so um, their foray into electoral politics and kind of formal institutionalized politics was the aberration and not the norm for them. Um, and there, you know, there is an argument to be, I'm not an I'm not an expert on Islamism, but there is an argument to be made that it's an authoritarian ideology to some degree. Um, that being said, we have parties, political parties all around the world that are quite right wing um, that can be constrained by democratic institutions and democratic accountability. We just don't have that in the Palestinian case because it hasn't been allowed to emerge. Um, so on the on the Palestinian Authority side, we had, you know, these uh, uh, this wish and dream of elections back in 2021. Um, even though I argued previously, back, even back then, that like I don't think elections resolve the problem of the Palestinian Authority. There are structural reasons that the Palestinian Authority doesn't know how to function properly. Nevertheless, it was an opportunity for people to try to engage in the formal you know, political process and feel like they have an impact and also send a signal to leadership that they must answer and, 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 and be accountable to the Palestinian public, but those elections are canceled. Um, and that, that happened on the West Bank and then in, in Gaza that, you know, that has never happened. And so in July of this year, um, we had pretty big protests in, in the Gaza Strip against, um, you know, protesting Hamas governance, like being unable to uh, provide services and things like this. And so we, you can kind of tell that that is a, um, a protest against the status quo uh, and, and the continued status quo. Um, so, yeah, in terms of their governance, it's quite authoritarian as well. Um, and you can argue, I, I think the most proximate reason is the fact that there isn't a formal like, political process that Palestinian society is engaged in. And I, I, I would argue the international community has never been in, interested in Palestinian society being uh, having input in the political process, even back in the 90s. Um, but also there is this added element of like an Islamist uh, persuasion. Yeah. Okay, so in, 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 in short, we could say there was already this underlying kind of legitimacy crisis and uh, accountability, lack of accountability, the Palestinian public feeling increasingly disaffected with both major political parties before October the 7th. There was this mm -hmm. underlying uh, problems of governance, both in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip, that was largely neglected by the international, or even worsened in some cases, by the international community. Now, since October the 7th, obviously, since the outbreak of war, the question's focused on Gaza. So the first question I have, before we talk about options, is that the wrong way to think about this? In other words, the question that seems to be on everybody's mind is, you know, what happens the day after the war, assuming that Hamas is removed from power in the Gaza Strip, what happens in Gaza after? Is that the wrong way to approach the question? Should we be thinking more broadly about, you know, not just the Gaza Strip, but also the West? I mean, can you, is this kind of separation of these two questions part of the problem? I think so, to some degree. Like, I understand when people are thinking about short-term 
mm. kind of immediate needs. I understand why we're discussing the day after in Gaza, if there is to be a day after in Gaza. Um, but I, I think you're right that um, just focusing on that question forgets the fact that why we're having an escalation of violence in Gaza is because the overall conflict has not been addressed. Right. And what we're seeing in Gaza is one mode of violence, but we have violence in the West Bank as well. And we have violence, you know, in East Jerusalem. And so um, I, I, I do believe that we do have to think about this holistically. And if we're going to address the underlying causes of what happened on October 7th and in the aftermath of October 7th, which is, you know, one on everyone, you know, at the forefront of everyone's mind right now. And, you know, what's the arrangement going to be for governance and whatever remains of the Gaza Strip? We have to think about actually, you know, moving forward, uh, uh, finding a political pathway forward for the entire conflict, which means that discussion of reinstating the PA in Gaza or, you know, whatever it may be, it, we have to go a little bit beyond kind of the short term considerations. So I want to come to, you know, the question of the PA and, and what role it might or should take. But beforehand, I think the most important question, maybe one that's seldom asked, is what do Palestinians want? What, As far as you know, what do Palestinians in, in, in the West Bank in Gaza, what do they want? What, what, what would be there? I mean, obviously, they don't want to live under Israeli occupation or under or blockade. <laughs> so that's a given, I think we can safely say. But in terms of you know what? 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 The vision of rule would they like to see? I mean, would they like? Would would is there? Would there be support for the PA establishing again its rule in the Gaza Strip? The PA has already had this crisis of legitimacy and is you know seen as out of touch and corrupt. And so, what do uh, what do we know about the Palestinian public's wishes in 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 terms of uh, the uh, rule in in these areas? So I'm sorry to be an, giving an annoying answer, but the problem with answering this question is because of how many decades now, or how many years, almost two decades, um, where the political landscape in Palestine, in Palestinian politics has been hollowed out, mm -hmm. um, there aren't immediate alternatives that I can say like this op opposition leader versus that opposition leader, because they there hasn't really been a space for even within Fatah party, like a younger generation to be elevated or anything like that. Um, that doesn't, you know, what I, what I'm saying here though, doesn't mean that that can't emerge. We saw in 2021, for example, around the cancel, you know, before they were canceled elections, um, young parties emerging and things like this. So I'm not, I'm not suggesting it can't emerge. It's just that we don't have necessarily the full lay of the land right now. Um, that being said, I think, let me answer one part of the question first. So the Palestinian Authority being reinstated in Gaza would be seen terribly. Um, and I think they understand this. So the Palestinian Authority themselves, so Prime Minister Shteya said, like, we don't want to be seen as going into Gaza on the ba back of an Israeli tank. Um, so from my understanding of the recent reporting, they're suggesting Hamas play a junior role in whatever governance structure, So, which obviously... Israel will not accept, so it's kind of a non-starter. But um, I don't think that Palestinians necessarily want to, you know, throw the Palestinian Authority out the window, or, or especially the Palestine Liberation Organization, which has kind of a longer history of legitimacy. Um, but they do want to revive it. They, I think, Palestinians want to have a say in what happens at the Palestinian Authority level, which governs the West Bank and kind of, you know, uh, in the territories, um, whether or not that extends to Gaza as well as the Palestine Liberation Organization, which would encompass also diaspora Palestinians. Um, I think that that has been discussed over and over again and um, seems to me, uh, yeah, seems to me a, a main crux of, of uh, the issue moving forward is Palestinian input on whatever happens. So having some sort of election or having some sort of uh, uh, rearrangement before the Palestinian Authority is reimposed in Gaza or things like this. Um, now, in terms of like what they want for the conflict, two state versus one state, both, both uh, unfortunately have very low levels of support. But again, polling, it tells you the reality that you're dealing with. Right. Nobody has put forward something viable to the Palestinian uh, uh, public that they can, you know, buy into and and go along with. So. I think sometimes people have a tendency to look at polls and think, well, there's no hope. 
but it's just because like nothing has been articulated for them. And I think that if there was leadership that articulates something, we would see differences in the polling. So let me ask you on that then, because this is one of my own pet <laughs> fantasies, preferences, um, recognition of Palestinian statehood. Would, would I mean, and we're thinking about the sequencing, right? And um, you're, you're saying that there needed to be elections really before the Palestinian Authority returns to the Gaza Strip so that we'd have that legitimacy and it wouldn't just be seen as an imp imposed by the United States or the international community, which in which case it would end up, even if it was able to it's unsustainable. Um, in itself, it would just become another authoritarian, it would be even more authoritarian, essentially, mm -hmm. not to mention the massive challenges of, of reconstruction in Gaza and just, you know, be a uh, huge challenge for any any government. Um, but in terms of, so let, let's say there's going to be elections first, that if that's the necessary step that after some sort of short term interim, you know, administration to lead to new elections, would some people have proposed lately this idea of recognition mm -hmm. um, of because one of the one of the underlying reasons for why the Palestinian Authority has lost its legitimacy is that it's not um, it was set up to be a state in the making and the state never materialized. Right. Would you think that recognition, of course, Palestine already has recognition from I think 138 countries, but let's say the United States. Let's say the Biden administration would. Do you think that would shift the dynamics? Would that, would that in, um, imbue new legitimacy in the Palestinian Authority or then a Palestinian state? Would that change? Because this seems to be, you know, very deep structural issues, and they all need to be addressed. Right. So, you know, so so in terms of, do you think that would make a difference, or is that just, you know? Um, because the occupation would continue, it wouldn't really change uh, the situation for Palestinians. It wouldn't really alter the dynamics that we're talking about. So I'm glad you brought this question up because um, statehood, I think, has been the idea of a statehood for Palestinians has been divorced from um, what a state actually means. So a state has to have sovereignty. And um, there are some people, there are some actors that are so extreme, they don't even want to use the word state for Palestinians. Um, they don't even want to give them that, even if devoid of all sovereignty. But then you have, you know, even Netanyahu, I believe, um, during the minus. Trump administration, yes. yeah, state minus or said they can call it a state, but it won't have sovereignty. Um, so I, I don't think that alone would create legitimacy for the Palestinian Authority, because I think Palestinians, the Palestinian public and Palestinian intellectuals are very wary of this state divorced from sovereignty. They don't want, you know, the Palestinian public does not want self-governance. It wants actual sovereignty. It wants not less than a state. It wants an actual state. So, so they might see it as a trap in a way. Uh, they might see it as a trap, but where it could be useful is if the United States, like insofar as that state recognition is a form of leverage mm -hmm. and actually then follows from that, actually changing some right. of their policies towards the Israeli government and creating conditions and 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 leveraging their power over the situation because there really is no actor on right. this planet as important to this conflict as the United States and it has completely forfeited that leverage. So if statehood comes as part of a signal to the Israeli uh, leadership that the United States is taking a different tack and will expect a different tack from Israeli leadership, then okay, that could be a first step. I think it's not enough for the for Palestinian society unless they see actual discussions of what it would entail to give them sovereignty. Right. Um, so yeah. When you hear, say, Secretary of State Blinken talking about, you know, the return of the revitalized Palestinian Authority what, uh, to to Gaza, yes, what what's your reaction to that? What do you make of these kinds of you know statements? I, I cringe at like. <laughs> I, I cringe at what he means by revitalizing. Right. What are you thinking? I mean, is that, you know, I mean, given the fact that you've argued that, you know, the United States played a role in the in the in in the authoritarian tendencies, in a sense, in its decline. Um, so you're you'd be kind of skeptical that there's that amounts to any real change in US policy or or that a revitalized Palestinian authority isn't even possible without these more deep uh, structural changes. Uh, so I, again, I think that it can, it, I think it, a couple of things can move at the same time. So I'm not suggesting that we can't start working on revitalizing the Palestinian Authority. I just worry that the American 
American approach to revitalizing the PA authority or the Palestinian authority is to shuffle some people around right. to tell Mahmoud Abbas, like, go ahead and retire. Let's bring the next person that we already know and have vetted. And, and there's like a few select people that are discussed. And and that doesn't that's not that's not going to be seen as enough for the Palestinian public. It's not going to achieve Palestinian buy in. And I I don't think it's unreasonable to to incorporate that. I mean, we have lessons from previous conflicts where, like in Northern Ireland, like people were allowed to vote on parts of the peace process. I don't think that that's unreasonable to suggest in this case as well. So that's that's why I said I would cringe. It's like I don't know what they mean by revitalization, and I don't think at this moment I have any reason to think it would include actual accountability to the Palestinian public. And if it would be more than a kind of cosmetic set of changes. Right, maybe a slightly younger leader. Right. right. Um, what about inter, uh, regional actors? Um, so we talked a lot about the United States, what the US wants, and it, you know, wants some kind of, wants the Palestinian, clearly the Israeli government, current government and Netanyahu obviously don't want that. So just, you know, setting that aside, that. Yeah. Um, where do you see other states in the region are they players in this? Who are the important players in terms of, you know, obviously Qatar has played an uh, important role in supporting Hamas, um, providing it with funds, uh, but Qatar, and then you have obviously Egypt has a big state. Where uh, is there a common, I mean, I would, I would doubt, is there a common Arab position on this in terms of Arab states, or is it like we've seen in, in other countries where different Arab states are taking different sides on, you know, on, on some of them. I mean, I'm thinking of like Sudan, for example, where, you know, I mean, is that, is, are we seeing in, t- intra-Arab divisions mm-hmm. also playing out on this question of governance? Yeah, I think there is like variation amongst Arab uh, governments on how much of a role they have envision for the Islamist parties. Um, some do not want any role. Um, in fact, um, I mean, this would not be the first time that they're directly like a Jordan and an Egypt are they're getting directly involved, you know, paying visits to, the, to Mahmoud Abbas in 2021. There were visits paid to try to convince him to also cancel elections. And he was more than happy to oblige. So th- there is always that kind of inter- inter-regional aspect. Um, um, so I think that complicates things. But um, at the end of the day, like, yeah, so... There isn't a single unified Arab position, um, and on how much of a role Palestinians should play, there also isn't a unified position, especially in the aftermath of like, you know, the Abraham Accords and some of the Arab-Israeli normalization. So I think, yeah, it's it's different actors. There's countervailing pressures on, and they've picked, you know, their favorite leaders from amongst Fatah Party, and um, that's actually a a huge distorting role as well on on how things would should function, which is why it's so imperative that we allow the Palestinian public to engage in the political process and 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 choose for themselves because it can offset some of these pressures um, uh, and they can be the direct you know constituent. Absolutely. So how um, I mean this is a big question and we only have a few minutes left. Um, but, you know, th- we, we've talked around the question of kind of, I mean, we talk about Hamas, uh, Gaza after Hamas's rule, but in some shape or form, it's likely that Hamas, maybe under a different name, will continue to exist, at least as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a movement. I mean, it's embedded in, the pal- in Palestinian politics. Obviously, it has external leadership. Um, it's, it has leaders in Turkey and Qatar and elsewhere, also in the West Bank. Um, what you know? What's your view on the question of incorporating Hamas into, or maybe under a different name? I mean, do you first of all see? I think Tarek uh, Bakoni has. Uh, you know, Hamas is going to be around, even if it's defeated on the ground in Gaza. Do you agree with that? And then, what does that mean going forward? Is it a question of, you know, I like to think maybe naively of the um, Northern Irish peace process with the Sinn Féin getting the IRA, its military wing, to disarm, and then mm-hmm. Sinn Féin becoming part of the process. Is that it just like pie in the sky to think about the disarmament of Hamas as maybe a way of incorporating Hamas into the PLO, which is what um, some have suggested, and maybe Hamas might even be willing, or some parts of Hamas. In other words, you know, assuming Hamas loses power in Gaza, 
what's that what what's next is it just gone or do we still have to think about some way of how Hamas might be incorporated into Palestinian governance that's a really good question so um yeah I think I agree not because obviously I'm not because I myself am a supporter of Hamas just to be Nor clear I, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. it's just a but, social fact right it's it's kind of a fact that they first of all are an organization that is multifaceted um as you said, to some degree has, I mean, not a great deal of popularity ideologically, but some, um, and then was also outside of the Gaza Strip. So even if you achieve some level of quote unquote eradication in the Gaza Strip, you're not getting rid of Hamas. And also Hamas is not all of armed resistance. So we have Islamic Jihad, for example, and then we have these like unaffiliated militias that are, you know, popping up in the West Bank. Um, so there is an argument to be made that the way to like you cannot incorporate them they continue to be spoilers to mm -hmm. the political process if they if um if they're not incorporated in some umbrella organization like the Palestine Liberation Organization so Salam Fayyad the previous one of the previous uh, Palestinian prime ministers has written about this as well um what remains to be seen is like how i don't know i think especially in the aftermath of October 7th i don't know that the international community would accept that at all. Um, and also Hamas itself, I think, right now the bargaining arrangement is very narrow. Um, and so I, I'm not sure that um, they would be willing to play along with that. Um, but yeah, just because you destroy some level of um, capacity on the ground will not mean that, you know, especially because you're generating a lot of grievances in the way that you're doing it, given the level of devastation in Gaza, it won't mean that Hamas, you know, won't be able to win some level of like hearts and minds. Um, so, yeah, it's it's a really tough question, and the kind of logical conclusion to what should be done with a group like Hamas or any kind of group that has armed resistance as a component um, and uses armed tactics, uh, you know in some ways illegitimately in terms of like their tactics it's it's hard to see how it's given the international landscape how it's going to play out to be honest yeah yeah i mean you know there's always the possibility of course of if i mean a few years ago there was the question of salafist jihadist groups operating in the after i mean one of the one of the arguments for having Hamas was that they policed other organizations in the Gaza Strip. And when you take them Hamas out of the picture, at least there's an address in some sense. Right, uh, right. Whereas with, you know, potentially the, the next generation, if you like. Of, pop ups. Yeah. yeah. And they could be worse and even harder uh, to work with because, you know, they don't have leaders in Qatar, for example, who yeah. uh, so um, who have some incentives uh, to remain in this position, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, the greatest danger, in other words, might be anarchy. Um, you know, uh, where there is nobody in control, or, or conversely, the Israelis just end up in a kind of situation like southern Lebanon, where they end up occupying for many, many, many years. Yeah, unfortunately, that that's seems increasingly likely. That's where I was going. So you think that at the moment, looking at this kind of landscape. And the, the the fact that the international community probably, I agree with you, is unlikely to consent to any role of Hamas. Um, and maybe Hamas wouldn't even be interested in it anyway if it's left standing. Um, and, you know, it might just be the, the outcome, by no means the max, the best outcome, might end up just being Israel's effectively left running, the right, ruling over Gaza um, in the absence of any other option. Well, it's not necessarily in the absence. There are other options, but Israel refuses them. And right. so right. my, yeah, I just think to myself, like we have, we're seeing the, like in real time, we're seeing this conflict prolong decade after decade now. Um, and so, yeah, given that Israel rejects other arrangements, Arab, PA, it already has stated, Israeli leaders have stated that only Israeli Actors well, will be involved. Their, um, they haven't put out their ideas at all. Um, they just said I, no so far. I think. Yeah, they they haven't said an idea, an alternative idea. But Netanyahu has said like there won't only Israeli like right. boots on the ground. Only um, security. Yes, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So um, 
So given that that's the case, it, it just seems to me like a very short term win. I don't know, maybe to seem strong in front of the Israeli public or something like that, but they're setting themselves up for more insecurity. They're setting themselves up for a prolonged conflict. Like, like literally, I, I, it's almost like I see a ticker in my mind of like, okay, we're adding another 10 years, another 20 years, another 30 years with this kind of short term uh, uh, vision of things. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't know that the international community, the United States, Israel, I don't know that anyone has learned anything in the last two months. Like, like mass violence is going to become more and more the norm. And I don't know that the coercive, the coercive um, option, the coercive resolution to this is actually working. Unless, of course, you know, they surprise us all and they bring the coercion up to a maximum level and we see a complete emptying out of, of the Gaza Strip, which is a possibility. Possibility. Um, on that very depressing note. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I want to thank you. No, I, I mean, I would like to say that the, and maybe the positive thing that's been learned is that there needs to be political change, new leaders in Ramallah and in Jerusalem. I think maybe people have recognized that at least. And so ha hopefully out of that recognition that nothing good can come out of the present situation until there's political change in, uh, at least in Ramallah in and Jerusalem, that maybe there's some uh, small hope, but uh, we will we'll have to see. But I thank you for 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 joining me today and uh, and sharing your wisdom and your insights. It's been a pleasure talking with you. I want to thank all of our listeners for joining us as well. You've been listening to an episode of Israel in Depth, produced by the UCLA Nazarian Center for Israel Studies. Thank you for listening, and be out on the lookout for more episodes soon. Thanks.